I don't uh, desire to be before you too long today as we go to the book of Hebrews chapter number 9 looking particularly at verses 24 through 28 again that's Hebrews chapter 9 verses 24 through 28 and it reads for Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation I want to talk to us from a subject that I'm pulling from uh, the 28th verse Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him here it is shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation I want to talk to us today from the subject of the second appearance the second appearance amen Lord do it in Jesus name Amen. The Hebrew writer here, as he's writing and he's speaking to us, he's talking uh, to the readers in relationship uh, to the perfect priesthood of Christ. And we know that the book of Hebrews, as we have coined it before, it is the book of better things. For the book of Hebrews speaks to us not only to the perfect priesthood of Jesus Christ, but it also speaks to us in relationship to a better covenant, a, a new and a more excellent way. It speaks to us to the perfect blood of that perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God who was slain to take away the sins of the world. The Hebrew writing here in this book, chapter number 9, is speaking to us in relationship to the perfect priesthood of Christ and specifically in verse number 24, uh, he writes that Christ has not entered into the holy place that is made with hands. In other words, he is speaking to us in reference to the earthly priesthood that they were familiar with under the old covenant or under the old law. The writer here is speaking about that priesthood and their performance of their duties as they would go in and offer the blood on the mercy seat. We realize and we understand that, amen, even in that day, we saw how that the believer, amen, would come and they would bring their sacrifice to the tabernacle or to the temple in the days of the temple. And they would come in and they would enter into the gates, amen, of the tabernacle or the temple, amen. And that's why the writer declares to us that we are to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. He says, be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. I believe that the psalmist the writer there when he's writing those words, amen, it is in reflection, amen, of appreciation to the fact that God has allowed or has instituted a way by which the sinner, amen, can come into fellowship with the divine God. And because God, amen, has prescribed that they were to bring, amen, a sacrifice or an offering that was to be offered up to the Lord once a year, amen, God now has made a way, amen, that the breach that sin had caused in the relationship of the believer and Christ could now, amen, be mended by them bringing a sacrifice. And so, because they were appreciative, because, man, they thank, thank the Lord. I know we're not able to gather, amen, within the four walls of the church and 
know that we're not able to gather together and worship as one family, but anytime God has made a way and given you a new day, you ought to open your eyes and open your mouth amen, and give God praise just for another day. That's what the old church used to say. They would say something like, just another day that the Lord has kept me. He's kept me from all evil with my mind shamed on Jesus. And so it was, amen, that they would come, amen, to the tabernacle and as they would enter into the gates with their sacrifice, amen, they would continue on from the entrance of the gate and they would come to the brazen laver. When they got there, amen, to the brazen laver, they were to wash at the brazen laver. When they would proceed past the brazen laver going to the brazen altar or the altar of sacrifice. For this was the place, amen, that they were to bring their offering to the priest and the priest was to receive their offering there to be slain on the altar and to be given to the Lord. Amen. The Bible declares that as they proceeded past the brazen laver and the brazen altar, then the priest would take the blood and he would go in, amen, into the holy place. And the Bible declares that when the priest gets into the holy place, amen, there must be table, amen, bread on the table of sure bread. And there, amen, is the menorah or the lighting of the candle. And there also is the altar of incense. And the Bible declares that as the priest has done his duties in making sure that there's fresh bread on the table and making sure, amen, that the candles are lit and making sure that the aroma is like God has prescribed for it to be at the altar of incense, then the Bible declares that the priest now takes the blood into the most holy place. Thank you, Lord. The priest would go in, amen, to the most holy place, and it was there, amen, at the most holy place where he would see this piece of furniture called the mercy seat, and the Bible declares that under the mercy seat, amen, was the Ark of the Covenant, amen. The Bible declares that the Ark of the Covenant, I'm almost there, y'all, the Ark of the Covenant, amen, amen, was representative, amen, or a symbol of the of God in the midst of his people. And the Bible declares that within the Ark of the Covenant, amen, was a piece of manna which was part of the testimony of God's provision for his people while they were in the wilderness. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant was a piece, amen, it was Aaron's rod, amen, which signified God's selection to the earthly priesthood. Amen. And it was there tablets uh, that God had given unto Moses as being the Ten Commandments. Uh, on top of the Ark of the Covenant then rested uh, the seat which is called the Mercy Seat. Uh, thank you Lord. Uh, I'm sure you might be asking why was it called the Mercy Seat? Uh, well the Bible declares that upon the Mercy Seat there were two cherubs, uh, two images of angels if you will. Uh, amen. And these spread towards one another huh, that was standing guard over the presence of the Lord. Huh? And the Bible declares that the priest, as he came into the most holy place, huh, he was to go to the mercy seat and to sprinkle the blood huh, or to place the blood of the offerer. Huh? Amen. The offering of the offerer. Huh? This blood was placed on the mercy seat. Huh? And if this blood was acceptable unto the Lord. Huh? Then the Bible, the Bible declares, then the priest would go out. Huh? Amen. And the people would celebrate at the appearance of the priest. Huh? For they understood that their sacrifice appeased huh? the anger of the Lord. Huh? Thank you, Lord. Huh? So it is that the writer here in verse 24 declares huh, that Christ is not going in to some earthly tabernacle. Huh? Amen. For if Christ had merely gone into an earthly tabernacle, huh, then he would have to be consistent huh, in constantly applying his blood. Huh? And in order for Christ to constantly apply his blood, huh, then it would be necessary for him to continuously suffer and die. Huh? But the writer declares that on this day of 
atonement. Huh? Amen. I heard one writer declare, amen, that the day of atonement, huh, it simply stands for at one minute. Huh? In other words, this day of atonement, amen, allows, huh, amen, the people of God to remain in relationship, huh, amen, in relationship with God. Huh? Well, the Hebrew writer declares, huh, thank you, Lord. Lord, I wish you to help me out this morning and put your hands together and 
Thank you, Lord. Jesus came in his first appearance. He came to deal with the sin problem. How now? How is Jesus dealing with the sin problem? Well, John chapter number 1, verse number 29 and verse 36. It declares, and the next day John seeing Jesus coming unto him. John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Verse 36, And looking upon Jesus as he walked, John says again, Behold the Lamb of God. In other words, John keeps referring to Christ as the Lamb of God. Because he understands now that Jesus in his first appearance, he did not come as the lion, did not come as the one conquering the world, but he came as the lamb. One writer in the book of Isaiah declared that he was like a lamb that was before his shears as dumb, yet he opened not his mouth. In other words, although Jesus knew everybody's motivation, Jesus knew everybody's mind, he still humbled himself. The Bible declares even unto the death of the cross. He says, and therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every man. That's why I declare that I am a Jesus only. Yeah. <laughs> 
preach. We got to preach the truth, y'all. Lord, have mercy. We still got to preach one Lord, one thing, and one baptism. I feel like an old Pentecostal preacher this morning. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God who is Father of all, who is above us all. And if you have received Christ, he's in you all. You ought to get excited right there.
you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why are you preaching like that when men need to be comforted in such turbulent times? Well, I'm just preaching the book. For I heard the book in First Thessalonians. I'm getting ready to get out of here. I heard the book in First Thessalonians. Back again, secular society. 
such a hurry. We put God on the clock. But can I tell you that eternity is so important that there is no clock. And I wouldn't mind spending a few extra minutes making sure that I made my, my calling and election. I made them sure. I thought I was going to preach today the pricelessness of the soul.
them for their sacrifice without and not acknowledge rather or ignore the sacrifice of our Savior. Amen. He gave the greatest sacrifice for all of our freedom and so we celebrate amen. We celebrate him and certainly we celebrate these as well. Amen. We're going to move forward in the service. Amen. On this morning but uh, before we do I do want to also acknowledge Amen. That is so much that is going on in our world today. Amen. There's such a great loss of life that we are experiencing in these times. Amen. And, and I, I want to just give special recognition and acknowledgement. Amen. In remembering the memory of our beloved mother, uh, Mary Booker, of our beloved brother, District Elder Lucian Booker in Lexington, Kentucky. Amen. They're on our hearts and on our minds this morning. And certainly we're praying that God would strengthen them and the family. Amen. Strengthen the church family there as well as our beloved Bishop Johnson. Amen. Our OCT family. We're thinking about you this morning and we're praying for you. Amen. And just so many others, amen, that have uh, dealt with and are dealing with the tragedies of life, the realities. Amen. That we're going to leave here. But we're trusting God. Strengthen on this morning, amen, and that God would touch those that are, amen, still dealing with ailments in their bodies and sickness because we yet know that God is a healer, amen, and I'm excited today because I know that it, as my father would say that if he doesn't heal me in the temple world, I'm healed eternally already, amen, because of the bloodshed of Jesus Christ on Calvary, so we celebrate, amen, them and their memories today and we hold up those families and all those that have been impacted, amen, by a loss in this season. We're trusting the Lord to be their strength today. Today, before I get into the word of the Lord, I would give you the opportunity that if you have not already, you're able to go visit our website at emmanuelnashville.org, emmanuelnashville.org, and you're able to go there and to sow, amen, and to give, whether you're tithe or offering, you're able to give there if you hit that giving tab. Uh, you'll be able to sow your seed into the ministry. Likewise, if you don't want to use the online portal, you're able to, amen, to mail in uh, your gift to the P.O. Box at 1196 Hendersonville, Tennessee, 37077. Again, P.O. Box 1196 Hendersonville, Tennessee, P.O. Box, excuse me, zip code 37077. I'm going to get ready to get in somewhat, as we would say, in a quandary. Amen. I feel, amen, as they have stated before, that these are the best of times, even though for some they seem to be the worst of times. But I understand, amen, that God is yet on the throne and God is up to something great and amazing. And I don't know about you, but I'm poised and I'm positioning my spirit to receive and to be a part of what God is doing. I'm feeling real good in my sanctified soul right now, if you can't tell it. Amen. I, I, I realize that God is in control, and I, and I don't know about you, but amen, it was the Wyans that used to sing a song many years ago that says, look like I can feel the breaking of day. I may not be able to articulate or to give you direction as to what tomorrow is going to hold, but I do know right now who holds tomorrow. And I do know that God is up to something great, so I want you to to be encouraged this morning through the word of the Lord. I want to go to a very familiar passage of scripture been found in St. John chapter number 10. I want to read verses 10 through 15. St. John chapter number 10. Reading verses 10 through 15. And I pray that this word today is received. Amen. In the spirit in which it is given that God would touch the ears of our hearts and our spirit, that we might hear what the spirit is saying to the church. St. John chapter number 10, beginning at verse number 10, it says that these cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus declares, I have come that he might have life and that he might have it more abundantly. He says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. 
The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. And I, he says, am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I want to pull the throat for today's subject or message. Man, looking particularly at verse number 10, the thief cometh not but for to kill or to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I am come that you might have life, hallelujah, and that you might have it more abundantly. Today, I want to speak to us from this subject, the door of deliverance. The door of deliverance. Lord, do it now. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen and amen. The door of deliverance. When we're looking at these verses of Scripture, essentially what we're seeing in these verses is that Jesus is speaking of himself distinctively as being the good shepherd. As Jesus is speaking to us, amen, as it relates to who he is as being the good shepherd, he is raising uh, this distinction and uh, describing himself, amen, as being the good shepherd by using descriptions and identifications that would cause we, the people of God, or the sheep of God, to be able to discern between here particularly imposters and real shepherds. Now, I'm not speaking this message today, amen, because I realize, amen, that this is not necessarily Pastor's Appreciation Month. And I'm not trying to get the people to understand or to appreciate, amen, our shepherds in a specific way. But I would say that because we're in a time in which one of the greatest needs that our world is suffering from is from a need of good leadership, we ought to all pause, amen, and to celebrate God and to celebrate those that God has given into our lives to give us direction and care in such terrible and turbulent times. Jesus is raising here, amen, the description and identification to us, amen, as the sheep as it relates to the identity of the imposter or the thief, amen, in contrast to that of a real shepherd. He writes here in verse number one, and then in chapter number 10, Jesus declares, Verily and verily, we say often, when we hear those words, verily and verily, it is a, amen, it is a, a joke or an unction to the listener to really pay close attention to what is about to follow. And so Jesus says, Verily and verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up, amen, some other way, the same is as a thief and a robber. Essentially what Jesus is saying to us when he speaks to us about, amen, this sheepfold, amen, we understand, amen, that the sheepfold was not just, amen, the, the, the multitude of sheep that gathered in one place, but we also understand that the sheepfold was the place, amen, of shelter by which the shepherd would lead the sheep into this place and they would be able to be bedded down at night, amen, in safety, free from the attack of predators, amen, and enemies. Man, essentially the sheepfold was a place where the was, amen, established by, amen, them building up stones or whether they, man, had erected a fence, they would place this sheepfold, amen, against, amen, whether it was a mountainside or whether it was stone, a stone backing, they would place this sheepfold or fencing around the sheep and, man, the sheepfold would have one door or one entrance or access, amen, enabled by which the shepherds could get to the sheep, amen, and so Jesus says that if anybody decides or determines, amen, to get access to the sheep by any way other than coming through the door to the sheepfold, Jesus then identifies these characters as being thieves and robbers. You might say, amen, that we have surmised that a thief and a robber, amen, is the same person, but I want to suggest to us that there is a distinction between a thief and a robber. Y'all need to hear me today. There is a difference between a thief and a robber because we understand, amen, that a thief is a thief because he steals through secrecy. 
See, amen, is not open. He is not deliberately, amen, apparent to those as to his motivation for why he's desiring to gain access. He is a thief by stealth. Amen. And a robber. Yes, Lord. A robber, amen, is distinctly different from a thief because, man, a robber steals not through stealth but through violence. Now I can hear the word of the Lord. Thank 
thank you, Lord. We uh, must understand something here. Uh, Jesus begins to declare uh, that he is the good shepherd. Uh, and in being the good shepherd, uh, he identifies two characteristics or two essential elements. Uh, for he declares that because I am the good shepherd, uh, he says, I am known by my sheep. Uh, in other words, I'm in relationship. Uh, with my sheep. In other words, my sheep are led by a voice that they hear my God sparingly in their lives. But my sheep are being led by a voice that frequents their journey. My sheep are being led by a voice that's been there through their rearing. A voice that has been there through their matriculation in life. to us. Amen. In order. Amen. For the sheep to follow the right voice. Thank you Lord. It's not just up to the shepherd to know who his sheep are. But the Bible declares that the sheep now are familiar with the voice of the shepherd. I'm going to get that in a minute. Y'all just hang on. The sheep are familiar with the voice of Shepherd. It is essential, brothers and sisters, that we are familiar with the voice of the shepherd. Because during this time of separation, amen, there's a lot of noise that's going on. My God, when the other shepherds come out and they begin to call the sheep, my God, there's a lot of voices that are speaking. Not only that, the sheep, there's a stirring the sheep as they seek to identify the voice of their shepherd against the voice of all the other shepherds that are calling out. And I need somebody to understand that although we're hearing a voice, I might as well jump since I'm here. Although we're hearing a voice that's protruding out of the state house, we've got to listen to the voice That's attempting to speak into the lives and to the ears of the hearer may not have the right motivation, but you need an ear. Yes, Lord, you need an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. The Spirit is saying when things things get chaotic. that the first door 
understand freedom. Well, freedom, yes, Lord, freedom as a verb. My God, the word now is coupled with the idea of deliverance. In other words, you can't have freedom if you have not experienced deliverance. Thank you, Lord. You cannot have freedom except you've been delivered. And deliverance now, it is the action or the process. Thank you, Lord. By which one is rescued or set free. So if we go celebrate being free, we can't celebrate being free without celebrating the process by which we've been rescued. And some of y'all don't want to tell the truth out there. But everybody that's been rescued, he did not rescue you from the front pew of the old church. But if the truth be told, my story of rescue for sure very deeply stained within. And I was thinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. And from the waters, he lifted me. Now safe am I. I can't celebrate freedom and ignore my process of deliverance. Some of us, he delivered us off a of skid row. Some of us, he delivered us out of the crack house. Some of us, he delivered us, my God, out of the red light district. I'm just trying to get on your street now. But he, he has delivered So if I'm going to celebrate deliverance, if I'm going to celebrate freedom, I got to celebrate my process of deliverance. Now freedom has a verb. It means I got to pay attention to my process of deliverance. But freedom as a noun, it stresses the compact effect of the combination of the verb and the noun. Y'all just stay with me for a moment. Freedom as a man is not just about the action that happened, but a freedom as a noun it is completeness, it is enduring essence, it is a continuation of a process that's begun to gain, been to gain in my life. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. What am I trying to say? Freedom as a verb simply celebrates what is done in your life. But freedom as a noun must be coupled with the understanding of the process that it brought me through. And I am not the sum total of my process, but I'm the sum total of who I am. Essentially, the adverb of freedom 
just one line uh, that just continues to ring in my ear. Uh, the key character in the movie uh, had been a slave uh, and he had been fighting, uh, longing for liberty. Uh, he had been longing, uh, longing to be free. Uh, no doubt like some of y'all out there, uh, you smiling but you're not free. Uh, the thief has been holding your joy hostage uh, with the threat of a virus. Uh, but the devil is a liar. Uh, I tell him to his face uh, in the power of the Holy Ghost uh, as a son of God. Uh, I dare not bring a railing accusation uh, against Satan. Uh, but I hear the word of the law. Uh, when Michael had to stand against Satan, uh, he did not stand in the presence of who said, Lord Satan, the Lord God rebuke you. I got authorization from the supreme force in the universe to tell you to get your stuff and go. Well, in that movie, he got, began to fight, wanting to be free. They kept on beating down, beating down his fight, found himself in the middle of a Can I tell you today, your faith, your peace, 
your joy can be secure because of the door of deliverance that has been provided for all of you. If you're out there today, you've not been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Amen. You can call in. You can come in. And we've got water in the pool. Amen. We're willing to take you down in Jesus' name. Don't get nervous. We're willing to take you down in Jesus' name and believe that there's a great big God in heaven waiting to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Perhaps that's you today. You can call in at 615-847-3461. Perhaps you've already been baptized, but you've not received the infilling of the Spirit of God. For the Bible declares, Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man is born of the water and of the Spirit, he simply still birth. In other words, though the baby may be born, coming out, becoming dead to the womb of the mother, and now being exposed to new life, if there's no spirit, no wind inside the body of that baby, that baby is still born. Honey, you can go down in water, but you need the baptism of the Spirit of God on the inside of you. You've not had that experience. Would you call in? Would you text in? Amen. Would you consider the single or father? I pray today that those that are under the sound of my voice, no matter where they may be, Lord, wherever life may have them, I pray, God, for those that have not experienced your divine love, the liberty and the freedom that comes from knowing you. I pray, God, that you would stir up their pure mind, stir up their hearts, cause them to understand the urgency of the season and the times in which we live, to know, God, that the handle of opportunity is on the inside, on the inside of their hearts, and they must turn that Say it, amen. Amen. I 